From the KPFK studios in Southern California, it's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrove, and unfortunately, David Feldman is having some technical difficulties, so uh, he's not joining us as of yet. He may jump in a little bit later, but we do have the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hello, Steve. We'll miss David. We do miss David, desperately, but we're going to soldier on, and I'm going to put some topics on the table here. Last week, President Trump wrote an op-ed, which was published in USA Today. I think we know enough about Donald Trump to know that he probably didn't actually write it himself. And it was all about Medicare for all and how bad it would be for America. And not surprisingly, it was full of lies. Just about every major news media organization, broadcast, print, and electronic blasted the president for those lies. Aside, of course, from Fox News, they just kind of reported on the controversy. Even Jimmy Fallon called him out. And I think we all know that when you've lost Fallon, you've lost America. Well, what this attack on Medicare for all indicates to me is that the Republicans are very afraid of this idea. So on the show today, we are going to talk with an activist who has been campaigning for Medicare for All. He's actually on tour promoting it all across the country. He's going to come to us from a tour stop in Dallas this week. And his name is Michael Lighty, and he's the director of public policy for National Nurses United. I actually have a soft spot for nurses. My mother was a nurse. So who are you going to trust about your health care, Donald Trump or my mother? We'll talk with Mr. Lighty in the first half of the show. In the second half of the show, we're going to talk about Ralph's latest book. I know some of you might be thinking, wait, didn't you just do a show about Ralph's latest book? We did. The Fable, How the Rats Reformed the Congress. This is a new book. Ralph writes books like I change shirts, people. This new book is entitled To the Ramparts, How Bush and Obama Paved the Way for the Trump Presidency and How It's Not Too Late to Change Course. We're going to dig into that one as well as make our way through a raft of your listener questions. Somewhere in between, we will catch our breath and check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber, with his weekly report on crime in the suites. But first, let's talk to someone who is on the ramparts of the healthcare fight. Michael Lighty is the director of public policy for National Nurses United. For over 25 years, Mr. Lighty has organized, written, and spoken for improved Medicare for all. He is currently the lead policy analyst for a single-payer bill, SB 562, the Healthy California Act. At the California Nurses Association since 1994, he has coordinated campaigns for an HMO Patients Bill of Rights, Clean Money Elections, and nationally for Robin Hood Tax on Wall Street. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Michael Lighty. Thank you so much, Steve. And, And I should say that I am currently on sabbatical from National Nurses United, so they have generously given me some time off to do this work. Well, Michael, welcome indeed. I go back a long way with the California Nurses Association. We went up and down the state of California once in buses pressing for a statewide initiative, which was on the ballot to give single payer full Medicare for all, free choice of doctor and hospital to the people of California. Unfortunately, the industry spent a lot of money on TV to distort it, and we lost that fight, which is a fight we are continuing all over the country. Here's my first question. You and I and others have read and written, spoken about full Medicare for all single payer for years. I'm astonished at how little reference there is in the media to this country to the north of us called Canada, where the people look like us, and we're in the late 60s and early 70s, starting in Saskatchewan, the province, they installed a single-payer system, that is, public funding of health care, private delivery of health care. This is not socialized medicine, as Britain has. And it works. Every health care system in the world has problems. We should have Canada's problems. They cover everybody in Canada at a per capita average, half of what we spend. And we have 29 million people without any health insurance, even with Obamacare, and 30 million more underinsured. And so in Canada, they spend about $4,500, give or take, per capita a year to cover everybody. And we spend over $9,500 a year to cover not everybody. 
And in Canada, they have their free choice of doctor and hospital. They have better outcomes. They have far less anxiety, dread, and fear. They don't not move from one job to another because they might not get health insurance in the second job, and on and on. Why isn't there more mention of Canada to make the case for single payer here? Well, Rob, that is a very good question, and it is a great honor to be on this show with you and talk about it, because what's, of course, funny about it is you hear often when you go around the country, you encounter these anecdotal stories about, oh, my God, my aunt couldn't get a hip surgery in Canada for six months. But what you just outlined is the truth rather than those anecdotes. And it's no wonder that you don't hear Canadians clamoring for the U.S. healthcare system. It's like, oh, yeah, let me, let me have uh, Aetna instead. You know, it just doesn't happen. And the reason I think we don't talk enough about Canada is because it's part of a media narrative that says government can't do anything right. And when it comes to health care, that's the last thing we want. And it turns out, in fact, that the Canadians have discovered that not only is government more efficient, but having a Canadian Medicare, and that's what they call it, brings the country together. It both rises from a sense of social solidarity and enhances it and builds upon that. And so when you talk to Canadians, you find that Canadian Medicare occupies a central role in the national identity. And that's very threatening, I think, for a lot of folks on the American side, because it contrasts with the supposed individualism, hyper-individualism that characterizes our society. So the neighbor to the north, as you say, that, that looks very much like us in terms of it's a very much more diverse country than people realize, and it has a very similar economy and kind of population. So we don't want, in, in the media narrative, to make that comparison because it is unfavorable to the American system. That's a good point. Like the Reader's Digest is always distorting what's going on in Canada in the healthcare area. In Canada, nobody dies because they can't afford health insurance to get diagnosed and treated in time. In the U.S., even after Obamacare, based on a Harvard Medical School peer-reviewed study by doctors Wallander and Himmelstein, about 35,000 Americans die every year because they can't afford health insurance to get diagnosed and treated in time. And of course, far greater numbers get sick and injured for that cause. That is, they can't afford health insurance. And I might add that the attack on Canada is almost always focused on delays. Well, first of all, when the Conservative Party took over in Ontario, they closed 23 hospitals. That's not good for preventing delays. There are forces in Canada that want to monkey wrench the system, and they're helped by U.S. companies that want to get in there and make profit. But I know a lot of people in Canada. I have relatives in Canada, and they don't have to wait except for elective surgery, for example. They may have to wait. But how long is the wait when you don't have health insurance and you can't pay for anything in the U.S.? It's interminable. And in Berkeley, sometimes you have to wait months for certain procedures. There aren't not enough primary care doctors in the U.S., so even with this huge profit-making system, there are all kinds of blockages. And in Canada, you don't have a drug industry that says pay or die the way our out-of-control drug industry, profiteering, outsourcing to China, bringing the drugs in without adequate supervision by the FDA. We had a program on that by the author of China Rx, a wonderful, alarming book. So I think one way we should start taking single payer to a higher level, already H.R. 676 in the House of Representatives, as you know, Michael, has over 120 signers, all of them Democrats. So it's not like it's starting from scratch. We ought to talk more about the Canadian experience on the ground for Canadian families. I, I agree. And I think, Ralph, that what you say about delays is so true. If you actually look at the studies like the Commonwealth Fund does, you find that the U.S., to get a specialist, can take as long as six weeks. And when in the U.S., when you get diagnosed with something that requires a specialist, that's not elective. That's serious and urgent. In many cases, folks cannot get access to those appointments, and that's just kind of the random experience people have. The notion in the U.S. that's so counterproductive is that Americans use too much health care. And in fact, we use less health care. We have less access. And as you say, that's in part because uninsured, but also particularly the underinsured. We know from, again, Commonwealth Fund research that 42% of Americans with insurance 
are foregoing treatment, either a doctor visit, a prescription, or another kind of treatment. Those are folks with insurance who can't afford it. So the barriers to care are real, and the principle that Canada has solved that we have to talk about is guaranteed health care with no barriers to care. And that principle simply does not apply in the U.S. system except to the very wealthy. And, and the that, profiteering is staggering. You've done research yes. with the California Nurse Association on the CEO pay. Why don't you talk about the CEO pay of these giant well, hospital chains and other similar corporations? Well, exactly. You've got the insurance industry, the top five health insurance company CEOs make between 20 and $66 million a year in compensation. Stephen Helmsley, who runs United Health Group out of Minnetonka, Minnesota, is at the $66 million level. And that's not just for the for-profit insurers. It is typical that CEOs of nonprofit hospital chains make 7 to $10 million annually. Just CEOs of hospital chains who are nonprofit, supposedly charitable institutions. This executive compensation we identified in California over two dozen, not CEOs, but just two dozen executives in health insurance companies who make over a million dollars a year. And then you look at hospitals, it's not unusual to have medical directors making seven figure salaries. Administrators, as I mentioned, seven to 10 million. You've got at the same time a huge rise in the number of administrators in hospitals and a reduction or a flatlining of doctors and nurses. So the whole system is skewed, as you say, to profit making. And the result of that profit making are executives and in the for profit industry, they're driving short term results, restricting access to care in order to pad the bottom line, raise the stock price. You know, you said the head of United Healthcare, which administers AARP's Medigap insurance. Mm -hmm. You know that, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So, okay. so seniors are basically, this is, of course, the corruption of the system. Our premiums are promoting a business model that requires tax subsidies but enables huge profits. At the same time, they restrict our care. Now, so listen that, to this, listeners. If you're a CEO, like the CEO of United Healthcare, making over $60 million a year, that breaks down to over $30,000 an hour eight hours a day. $30,000 an hour, eight hours a day. Shame on this for allowing this to happen, number one. And number two, why don't you talk about the incidence of malpractice in this country? Well, the incidence of malpractice is basically insurance company policies and executives who kill people. And we know, for example, that Cigna denied treatment to a, a young woman, Natalie Sarkeesian, a few years ago, resulted in her not getting a liver transplant that would have saved her life. And these executives refuse to be accountable for the death that they are causing among folks who have their policies. And instead, it's essentially a failed business model, Ralph, because you know that we pay over $340 billion in subsidies to employers so they can buy this private insurance enriching these executives. And at the same time, it's a failed business model as a result, because without those subsidies, no one could afford to buy their product. And, and by the way, half of the health care expenditure in this country, which is about $3.5 trillion, is paid by taxpayers. That's right. Half. We have a publicly funded system, more by and large, a publicly funded system, and we're simply not getting our money's worth. So in that sense, it's a con because we're paying and subsidizing the purchase of a product that doesn't actually serve our health. We're talking with Michael Leidy, who's on sabbatical from the California Nurses Association, where he's directed a research group, which is very rare for unions, that monitored the giant corporations in this industry. I'm often astounded at the most articulate supporters of single payer and they don't make all the arguments that can be made. Here are three arguments that are not made enough, and they're pretty stupendous. Number one, we've had people on this program who are experts saying and documenting that 10% of all health care expenditures in any given year, at least, is drained away by computerized billing fraud and abuse. That's $350 billion with a B this year. Number two... Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine was only the latest peer-reviewed study coming out with a minimum figure of 5,000 people a week dying from preventable problems inside hospitals, hospital-induced infections, malpractice, 
other things that are preventable. That's 250,000 Americans a year dying from preventable hospital problems. And the doctors who put this report out a couple of years ago said that was their minimal figure. The third is insurance companies and others fighting to block wrongfully injured medical patients from having their day in court in a trial by jury, using the law of torts to get a remedy, to get compensation for their terrible injuries, to disclose some bad practices in healthcare firms around the country, and to deter unsafe practices. Why, Michael Leidy, do not our side, people in Congress, people who write opinion editorials, people who are advocates on the ground, use those three arguments more frequently? Yeah, I think we are caught up in a certain kind of a policy framework that doesn't address and articulate, as you say, some of the systemic problems on the delivery side, right? We're often focused on the financing side or on insurance. But really what we're talking about here is what's going on in hospitals and why it is so wasteful to our system as a whole. And there is first huge administrative waste in hospitals, whole departments devoted to billing and claims, preauthorization and so forth. But you're right. All those issues of hospital-acquired infections, of preventable incidents that result in morbidity, can be prevented in a system that makes patient care the priority. So from a nurse perspective, those problems relate directly to inadequate staffing. And the reason there are not registered nurses at the bedside is because the bottom line and the insurers don't reimburse sufficiently for that care. And Instead, hospitals end up going to different care models, boutique services for the wealthy, concierge-type arrangements in the hospitals, moving procedures to outpatient clinics. All these things undermine safety and at the same time enrich the corporation's bottom line, but do not actually provide a single standard of safe therapeutic care for all. And that standard of equitable care is what the nurses promote. And the only way to achieve it is, yeah, you've got to fix the financing, and then you've got to orient the dollars toward patient care and put doctors and nurses more directly in charge, improve staffing, and have the resources to adequately deliver care rather than siphon off into administrative waste, efficiency, and drug company profits, which is where huge amounts of the dollars go instead. You know, the California nurses pioneered under Roseanne DeMauro, its leader, who recently retired, what's called adequate staffing in hospitals, because these big corporations who pay their executives humongous money, try to cut costs by replacing skilled nurses with what they called in California care buddies, care buddies. And of course, that leads to so many preventable problems, serious injuries, deaths, and other horrific situations. That's right. That's exactly right, Ralph. And the only way to get to put nurses in in charge and to have adequate staffing is to take all those profit imperatives away from the system and not pay CEOs seven to ten million dollars, but actually pay more nurses, hire more nurses, pay the CEOs less, and that's how you can improve care. We've got to move from a system that is trying to restrict access to care in order to save money to a system that delivers care based upon patient need, and those providers are compensated for that and not just all the other ancillary services and profit-making that that goes on. We're talking with Michael Leidy, who is on sabbatical from his position as research director for the California Nurses Association. I loved that, Michael, when the nurses picketed Wall Street, they picketed when down in Washington, they had a march. I spoke to one of their gatherings near the White House, pushing for a transaction tax, a speculation tax on Wall Street sales of stocks, bonds, derivatives, and using some of that money, hundreds of billions of dollars could be collected using some of that money to provide health insurance for everyone. Not many unions do that. This is the most dynamic union in the country. And from that comment, let's go into what can we do about it. So let me give you a hypothetical. When Clinton wanted to expand health care coverage, Bill Clinton, he had Hillary assigned to the job in the 1990s. I looked around the country and I said, I wonder... How many full-time organizers there are in congressional districts trying to get this done? Because, you know, throughout American history, 
No major social justice movement occurs without field organizers, whether it's the labor movement, the farmers' progressive movement in the late 19th century, or the civil rights movement. And I couldn't even come up to the number of 100, 100 full-time people working on this. And that holds true when Obama tried to expand health care coverage. Don't you think that's one of the major flaws in organized labor, Michael Leidy? They got their health insurance. They could have got it for the rest of our country if they had enough field organizers from their surplus funds. Give me your comment on that. I do think that we have to recognize, Ralph, that, that you're right. We've had historic moments, 1993, which you're speaking of, where the AFL-CIO decided to endorse Hillary Care instead of single payer, and also there was a great effort to get behind the Affordable Care Act and the public option. I do think that they put organizers in the field on that effort to a greater level, but essentially you're right because workers are desperate for a different system. And the only way to organize that is on a grassroots basis and put organizers out there. We've been doing that. We've been doing that through National Nurses United, but it's not sufficient. And so what we found is that at the base, Medicare for All single payer is hugely popular, right? You've seen the polls, right? The the Reuters poll had 70% overall, 85% among Democrats, 52% among Republicans. And we know that workers who voted for Donald Trump, who make $30,000 or less, 52% of them in 2016 supported it. So the only way we're going to do this is through mass action and a mobilization and maximum pressure on members of Congress. And currently that's going on in some states. There's door knocking going on. We're trying to make Medicare for All essentially a litmus test in 2018, make it the defining issue in 2020. 85% of Democrats support it. And there's not a mobilization. There's not a media narrative that reinforces it. And the only alternative, really, to Medicare for All is going to be increasingly more costs onto workers and a kind of on your own health care system where you literally only get the health care you can afford. And I want to have loss of life, loss of limb, loss of health when you can't afford health care to get it diagnosed and treated. I don't think the heads of the Democratic Party are fully on board for single payer in this coming election next month. Are they really on board, the Democratic no. National Committee, or are they still footsieing around and trying to repress the insurgency that's going on among progressive candidates around the country in the Democratic Party? I think you're, you're on to it. They are trying to stifle this. I mean, imagine, Ralph, a political party anywhere else in the world that doesn't pursue a program that 85% of its supporters want. It's inconceivable. And so here you see the gap between the base and the donors, because the donor class of the Democrats are the ones who are invested in Wall Street, who would be affected by the speculation tax that could fund human need programs, that would be affected by the a rollback of insurance company profits. And it's that class that we're up against, represented by the Democratic leadership. Chuck Schumer was horrified at the notion that Democrats would support the elimination of the private health insurance, and yet it is literally killing people. So this disconnect is becoming intolerable, I think, and, and Donald and, Trump, you know, thinks that the Democrats are <laughs> so relatively passive on this that he can actually come out against full Medicare for all, come out against a majority of the American people. He'd get away with that absurdly false column in USA Today, which, by the way, Robert Weissman rebutted, head of public citizen. That's on the website, citizen.org, if you want the rebuttal. For our listeners who are going to flood the members of Congress, I hope, with phone calls after this program, Michael Leidy, to increase their level of impatience historically. In effect, full Medicare was proposed by Harry Truman. The American Medical Association blocked it in the 1940s. It was put forward tenuously by Lyndon Baines Johnson in the 1960s. He backed away and just went for Medicare and partial Medicaid because of all the money the Vietnam War was costing. The Vietnam War is reported to have cost millions of Vietnamese lives and about 55, 60,000 American lives, but it really cost a lot more American lives because by blocking full Medicare for all, it blocked the way to save over 45,000 American lives a year from the 1960s to the present day. So this has been going on a long time. It's ridiculous. It shows we are a weak democracy. We can flip this thing into the humane full Medicare for all. 
which, by the way, produces a lot better collective data on trends and perils than 1,500 insurance companies with proprietary data manage to do. This can move very quickly in Congress. And once you get it in Congress, overwhelmingly, doesn't matter who is in the White House. It's a, a wave of humanity, a wave of catching up to Western countries who have universal health insurance, a wave to catch up to Taiwan and Japan who have universal health insurance. And everyone's got to do their part. There's no such thing as, oh, I'm listening to this program. It's interesting, Ralph, but I'm just one person. You get several neighbors to make the calls. You buttonhole the members who come back in the next month looking for your vote for members of Congress or even your own state legislative members to put the heat on Congress. What do you recommend in terms of increasing the heat here, Michael? You know more about this than anybody. I think we've got to build organization, Ralph, and I think we've got to use that organization to build mass support. And I actually think that it requires everything we can do. But what it requires most is a strategic sense of really competing for power and be bold and make an aspirational, affirmative demand for guaranteed health care through Medicare for All. That represents an alternative vision to what the Republicans represent or what the donor class, the corporate Democrats represent. And if and I, and I honestly believe that if we were able to build the presence in every congressional district, as you've talked about, it is not a partisan issue. We can move Republicans who represent working class folks. We can move Democrats who wouldn't otherwise do this because it's not, quote unquote, safe. And it's only through that popular mobilization. And you and I have talked about this. We, there are small tactics we can do. Letters to the editor matter, right? Small group meetings that then build into a door-to-door canvas. And that door-to-door canvas recruits people to a town hall that tells stories about how inadequate the system is. And those stories point to an alternative. And then we build a bigger meeting that then is able to mobilize direct actions and members of Congress at their offices, at the district level, get into small media market papers. Obviously, we're building a story and a narrative about healthcare in social media. I think we literally have to do it all. But what is particularly frustrating is we've never seen the level of resource commitment, either from organized labor or nonprofit foundations, for Medicare for All that we've seen for every other type of liberal reform, right? $80 million to support the ACA. We have never seen $5 million committed nationally to win Medicare for All. We are going to have need to have resources to hire organizers to put them on the ground. And that is really the demand we've got to make on our institutions. If you support single payer, then actually put money and people behind it. And if we had everyone who supports it actually working for it, it would change the political expectation that we can't win it. And in fact, this is a winnable issue. It's a unifying issue. It brings people together because this is a public policy that affects us in the most intimate way in our lives. Do you hear that, listeners? This is a winnable issue. First of all, you have the single-payer bill that's been in the House. It's called H.R. 676. It is supported by more than 120 Democratic representatives in the House. That means 120 congressional districts back home, they're already on your side. And you can get it up to 190 pretty quickly if you make this a big issue and candidates start winning on this issue. And then it's off to the races. Once the wave from the public, once the rumble from the public gets going, it's unstoppable. It's a situation where the people lead and the leaders follow. Go to citizen.org. You'll get information about how to organize on single payer. It's public citizen. Go to citizen.org. Last words before we conclude, Michael Lighty. This can be a unifying issue. This can bring working people together to define the issue that is most affecting us every day, that we can actually use this as a model for making the decisions that determine our destiny. And this demand needs to resonate. And really, people need to understand that this is a popular program. It works. If we build a movement, we will win it. And we can break through power, as you say, on this question, and it'll open up possibilities that right now seem so distant. And I really urge folks to engage in this issue. Talk to your friends. Over 75% of the people are on your side. A majority of doctors even on your side. They want to practice medicine, not bookkeeping, and be harassed by bureaucrats and the corporations. And also a huge majority of nurses are on your side. So what are you waiting for, folks? You outnumber these corporations vastly. 
Take it over. Thank you very much, Michael Lighty of the California Nurses Association. Thank you, Ralph. Onward. We have been speaking to Michael Lighty on sabbatical as policy director from National Nurses United, who's campaigning across the country for Medicare for All. We will link to his work at ralphnaderadiohour.com. Now we are going to take a one-minute break and send you over to the National Press Building in Washington, D.C. to hear from our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. When we come back, we're going to talk about Ralph's new book, To the Ramparts, and also plow through some listener questions. You are listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Don't go away. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute for Friday, October 19, 2018. I'm Russell Mokhyber. Credit Suisse Securities will pay $10 million to settle charges brought by the Securities and Exchange Commission and the New York Attorney General regarding material misrepresentations and omissions made in connection with its now-closed retail execution services businesses handling of certain customer orders. The settlements required Credit Suisse to pay $5 million to the SEC and $5 million to the New York Attorney General. Credit Suisse created the RES desk to execute orders for other broker dealers that handle order flow on behalf of their retail customers. The SEC's order finds that although RES promoted its access to dark pool liquidity to customers, the firm executed an exceedingly minimal number of held orders, orders that must be executed immediately at the current market price in dark pools from September 2011 to December 2012. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokai. Thank you, Russell. So, Ralph, I uh, was watching MSNBC yesterday, and who appears with Ari Melber in between two guys, two DJs or something? It's you, and you were talking about your new book. Tell us about your new book. Well, it's called To the Ramparts, How Bush Obama Paved the Way for Donald Trump. But it goes even further back. You remember, Ronald Reagan was a fabricator. He smiled. He shrugged his shoulders, but he said to the press on two occasions, nuclear missiles, once released, they can always be recalled. Or when he was asked about homelessness, he said, you know, some people like to sleep out. (laughs) He was asked about hunger. He said, well, you know, there are people who are on a diet and the worst one. And he got away with this as governor of California, speaking to the Chamber of Commerce. In California at a luncheon, he was asked, Governor, what do you think about the emerging African nations? And Reagan shrugged his shoulders and smiled, cocked his head and said, well, when these guys have you to lunch, they really have you to lunch. That's his quote. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, so you can see he fabricated government statistics. He turned things up and down that were true and he made them fake. And Donald Trump's watching this. A younger Donald Trump is watching this and watching him get reelected in a landslide against Walter Mondale in 1984. And then comes along George Herbert Walker Bush and could have prevented the Gulf War easily the way the British did just when Saddam Hussein was rumbling his tanks toward Kuwait. He could have sent, you know, he's allied formerly with Kuwait, the U.S. They could have sent paratroopers group the way the British did years earlier. Mm -hmm. And Saddam would not have invaded Kuwait. Instead, there was a bloody war. Tens of thousands of Iraqis destroyed, you know, the drinking water, electrical systems in Baghdad destroyed. It laid the groundwork for the invasion of Iraq by his son, George W. Bush and Cheney. And then came along Bill Clinton, and he broke the norms on proper standards in treating women. And he was in all kinds of trouble with various women that he dealt with. Dealt with? That's a very charitable way to say it. Dealt with, yes. Yeah. And he cheated on his wife, and he got away with it. And Donald Trump, (laughs) the philanderer, the abuser of women, is looking at this on TV and saying, hey... That's interesting. And then along came George W. Bush and smashed all respect for our Constitution, international law, federal statutes, Geneva Conventions by his criminal invasion of Iraq and his sending drones all over and special forces. And Donald Trump's looking at this and saying, hey, (laughs) he got reelected over John Kerry. He got away with it. Well, you know, nobody has an antenna as sensitive as George W. Bush, except 
Donald Trump. And Donald Trump could write a book called Getting Away With It All. And he's watching all this. And along comes Obama. And instead of waging peace, Obama extends the drone strikes in Afghanistan and all over and allows Hillary to persuade him to blow apart Libya, which is still being blown apart, spilling into neighboring African countries, chaos, violence, militias. And Donald Trump is watching this and say, hey, you know, Obama did all this and the Democrats reelected him in 2012. What's there not to like? At the same time, the people back home, enough of them didn't do their homework. Enough of them didn't think of their own self-interest. All these politicians scurrying around, freezing the minimum wage, not giving them full health insurance, full Medicare for all, not cracking down on corporate crime, fraud, and abuse, looking the other way at huge waste and the expenditure of government taxpayer dollars, looking the other way when they bailed out Wall Street and they bail out every day, subsidies, handouts, various businesses. And, you know, when you get enough people in this country who don't take their voting duty seriously enough, A, to vote, over half the people stay home, or about half in presidential elections, it's even higher in congressional election year, or who don't even do their homework for an institution like Congress that spends 24% of their income. Imagine if a neighbor spent 24% of your income and could allow neighboring factory to pollute the air and water for your children to be exposed. Would you spend a little time trying to straighten out your neighbor or making your neighbor accountable? So that's what this book, To the Ramparts, does, Steve. It tries to say, look, Donald Trump didn't come out of some UFO. He didn't come out of some reality show. He came out from a political climate that enabled him to take all these things to an even deeper ditch. And if we don't learn from that, we'll think that, oh, when Trump is gone or resigned or doesn't get reelected, we'll be back to normal. No, we're not going to be back to normal because both parties have endorsed this degraded level of political irresponsibility, runaway government waste, runaway corporate crime wave, and the people left holding the bag. So Donald Trump is an obvious liar. How would you compare his lying to, say, the what you called fabrications that Reagan made? And, and you know, it's kind of sounds like what we talked with Alan Nairn about, where he admits I'm a crook. And people kind of found that refreshing because they think they're all liars. Uh, Donald Trump just magnified it. In other words, where Reagan would say 100 fabrications, let's say Donald Trump would say several hundred fabrications. The New York Times has documented almost 6,000 what they call misstatements, fabrications, or outright falsehoods, not to mention vituperative insults to individuals who cannot answer back because the press just covers his insults and not the rebuttals by his victims of his verbal sparring. So really, it's just more of the same. And to be fair to Trump, he is trying to open a door to North Korea, which his Republican and Democratic presidents before him didn't choose to do. It doesn't mean it's going to work, but at least it lowered the level of these counter threats between North Korea's dictator in the U.S. And remember when Trump said, I have my button on a much bigger number of nuclear missiles, Chairman Kim. So he is lowering the temperature on that for the time being. But by and large, you know, more drones, more special forces. I read in the papers the other day that special U.S. forces went into over 100 countries last year. And I don't think all of them were legally invited by their respective governments around the world and the various continents. Well, Seymour Hirsch was talking to us a couple of months ago about all the stuff we're doing in Africa that nobody knows about. Yeah, well, that's still a bigger story yet to be disclosed. In fact, you remember Seymour said that he he might write his next book on this. Yeah, we, we got soldiers and operatives in all kinds of African countries. It's interesting that most of Africa was broken up in colonies by the French, the British, the Portuguese, and even the Germans. 
in the 19th century and later. And yet they're not as present in these former colonies where they still have, you know, business contacts and educational institutions, religious institutions and so on. Nowhere near is the U.S. empire. So to the ramparts, is it organized sort of chronologically? Do you take us back to Reagan and then go through H.W. and then Clinton and and uh, No, it isn't. That, that gets to be a little tedious when you do that. It goes in and out. It has some interesting letters that I've sent to Bush and Obama. It mixes it up, so it makes it more readable. But that's generally the theme. And I might add, I didn't do justice to Reagan in terms of his fabrications, as uh, Mark Green did when he wrote his famous book, Reagan's Reign of Error. Reagan's Reign of Error by Mark Green. Wonderful book. Shows how much Reagan got away with just by smiling and shrugging his shoulders and with that nice voice that he had. Yes, for the avuncular grandpa. Yeah, that's true. Some of the stuff in in Mark Green's book is just beyond hilarious. Well, and of course, as we all know, regular listeners know, you are always offering a path forward, not just lamenting the past. So the the second part of it, this is one of the longest titles of of books you've had, which is how Bush and Obama paved the way for the Trump presidency and how it's not too late to change course. How is it not too late to change course? And how does that relate to the fable you just wrote, which we talked about a few weeks ago, called How the Rats Reformed the Congress? Well, not surprising to a lot of our listeners, I start with the Congress. The Congress is the fulcrum of our federal government and a lot of impact at the state and local level. I mean, that's where the appropriations, uh, authorizations, war declaration power, confirmation of judges, treaties ratified hearings on consumer protection, health care, minimum wage, all this can start with Congress. And the nice thing about it is it's the tiniest but most powerful branch of government under our Constitution. And it can turn around a lot of the executive branch, certainly can determine public budgets, defloat the bloated, wasteful military budget, as some retired generals and admirals have been calling for over the years. They can develop a huge jobs program in terms of public repair of our infrastructure, schools and bridges and public transit, sewage, water systems, you know, the same old list of our crumbling public economy and services. And so it gets back to 1% or less of the people getting together, organizing Congress watchdog groups. And, you know, I've done this in books and articles, and I thought maybe I better use a little humor. So I did this fable called How the Rats Reformed the Congress. It's actually quite timely because there's a major rat infestation in Washington, D.C. It's all over in the alleys, just uh, more and more complaints than ever before to the uh, D.C. authorities to do something about it. And it, it is affecting Congress. They're coming up from the catacombs below the Congress, which is almost something out of science fiction in terms of the fumes and the particulates right. and the pipes. It's so dangerous, they don't allow the senators and representatives to go down in an elevator. So in this book, the rats come up to the toilet bowls of the leaders of the House, the Republican, Democrat, creates huge embarrassment. They try to cover it up. A Damon Runyon-type character, a reporter, sniffing around. He gets the story. He puts it out all over the country. And the rest of the media gets into a frenzy trying to find out which bowls are being infested, which members of Congress are running off the bowls. And this developed such derision against an already low in the polls Congress that some activists perk up and say, you know, this is a great opportunity. When is the the last time we had so much public attention or interest in members of Congress? And they mobilize from the grassroots up, surround the Congress with hundreds of thousands of people, bullhorns demanding change, demanding their resignation. Three billionaires come into town. They say, hey, you know, we've got tons of money. Let's help fund these people so they don't go scratching with the tin cup to pay the expenses. And it is a lot of drama. The Wall Street masters get involved with the 
trade association people, lobbyists in Washington, they're trying to block it. They're trying to infiltrate the crowds with agitators. There's a lot of drama, but there's a lot of realism, Steve. Right. I wish this could become a, a little movie. It would be really fun. Right. There's too many Mickey Mouse movies. Let's have a real serious movie where the rats <laughs> help change the country. Ralph, you've mentioned this before, and I just want to ask you about it. You've, you, you said the Congress is the tiniest branch, the smallest branch of the government. What do you mean by that? It's 535 people. There's only nine people in the Supreme Court, one person in the White House. What? How is it the tiniest? Well, it's the tiniest compared to the executive branch. There's no doubt. The executive branch has over about 2 million people, military, civil servants. I see. And it's smaller than the federal courts, because if you take the federal district court, the Circuit Court of Appeals, and the Supreme Court, that budget is larger than the Congress. And it's smaller in another way. It's personal. People know their names. How many people know the names of the district court judges? You know, half the people don't know the names of their member of the House, to be sure. But, you know, in an instant, they can find their names. And a lot of people do know the names of their two senators and representatives. And why? Well, you know, District court judges don't go to clam bakes. They don't go to high school reunions and flaunt their presence. But members of Congress do. They don't like to engage in town meetings created by the citizens with a citizen's own agenda, summoning them. In this book, by the way, How the Rats Reformed the Congress, has the summons where the citizens summon the senators and representatives to their own town meetings and their own agenda. That was a very, very important tool of democracy that I outlined in this book, How the Rats Reformed the Congress. So personal politics should interest people. These senators, representatives, they have their own stories, their own virtues, their own frailties. They have kids or grandkids. They have their own friends back home. All these can be turned to the good in terms of making them accountable. Right now, Steve, Congress is a bubble in Washington encircled by thousands of corporate lobbyists whining and dining. You could almost see a cartoon on that. Yeah. And the best short way to describe Congress and its secrecy and its exclusionary attitudes toward the American people, other than asking them to vote, they get their money elsewhere, as you know. The best way to describe it in a short number of words, here it is. Congress is open for business, but closed for democracy. Ralph, now it seems like in the past couple of weeks with this Jamal Khashoggi murder that apparently happened in the Turkish consulate by Saudi Arabia, that some of Trump's own party in the Congress is finally pushing back against him. How do you see that playing out? I don't think that's going to have much stamina. I think the elections, Trump going to their districts, attaching to the Trump aura is going to prevail. Coming up next month, everybody's got to go vote. You know, you don't like who's on the ballot, write in your own name or say none of the above or vote for a third party. But you got to get out and vote because here's the prediction, Steve. Mm -hmm. Although more people are expected to vote next month than voted in the past off-year congressional election, which is 2014, about 115 to 120 million eligible voters, 18 years or older, will not vote. Just think of that number. Yeah. That's why I say it's easier, we think, and how we can turn it around. Because most of these bad regimes won very close. I mean, they either win in Ohio or Florida or Pennsylvania by very narrow margins. And those margins can be overcome by people going to vote and not staying home. So that's why I want people to really get this book, How the Rats Reformed the Congress. They can get it by going to ratsreformcongress.org, ratsreformcongress.org. And that's a serious website on how you can actually organize a congressional rat watchers group to watch Congress in great detail. A lot of our experience over the years, you can develop your own citizen congressional oversight or watchdog skills by using that website. And if you want discounts, there are five of these paperbacks offered for $50 and a discount offer. So you go back to ratsreformcongress.org. You can buy the paperback, or you can buy the hardback, or you can buy 
five paperback copies for $50. And you're on your way. It's a lot of fun. I like to say it's better than a good bridge game, but I don't say that too loud because <laughs> more people spend more time on their bridge game in, in one week than the American people spend on Congress. <laughs> Have you ever seen the magazine for bridge players and all the bridge contests and so on? It's absolutely fabulous. It's yeah. unbelievable. It's a complete sub-economy of delightful leisure. I yeah. envy them. Yeah, yeah. Well, we will link to How the Rats Performed the Congress at RalphNaderRadio.com, as well as the even newer book, To the Ramparts, How Bush and Obama Paved the Way for the Trump Presidency and How It's Not Too Late to Change Course. But right now, Ralph, we've got some uh, listener questions on the docket. Uh, you ready for me to throw a few of those at you? Here we go. Here we go. Our first one comes from a listener, Tammy Letts, who says, Ralph, can you address these two issues? One, how can we illegally obtain the names of those in Congress sued for sexual assault, harassment, with claims paid out by secret taxpayer-funded slush fund? Doing so might show Congress they are not above the law. And two, how can we start a movement to repeal taxpayer-funded pensions for Congress? Perhaps if we ban them from legislating their own perks, they will feel more beholden to protect Social Security. Well, first of all, some of these disclosures are already in the press. For example, uh, Congressman John Conyers had a matter settled with taxpayer money paid to the woman who filed the grievance. So the answer to the question, twofold. One is, ask your member of Congress to ask the House Ethics Committee to put out a, a complete list of all the settlements, secret settlements paid to women who complained about being sexually abused or assaulted. They have them. Some of them have already been put out. I'm not aware that they've all been put out. So I think your member of Congress, when you make that kind of request, is going to respond and get the House Ethics Committee to do so. So. Some of it is you can just go to a search engine and find, you know, put in the right words. And some of the members of Congress whose settlements were paid by the taxpayer, imagine that, will be public. Then you can go from there. The second, yeah, I've always uh -huh. said that we should demand a simple bill that says all benefits that members of Congress have given to themselves, pensions, health insurance, you name it, must be given to all the American people. If they're not, then they don't get it in Congress. And so if they don't provide the kind of pensions they're getting to the American people, then they don't get the pension. And I think Tammy is right. If the members of Congress are forced by the voter to be part of the risk, they'll be part of the solution. And they will defend Social Security to the hilt. Now, the Democrats do defend Social Security. It's the Republicans that are a real problem trying to privatize it, put it in, you know, in stocks, make the brokers rich, restrain the benefits. They can never get around Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Social Security. They have never gotten over that. Well, thank you for that question, Tammy. This next question is kind of unusual. It's from listener Sharon Henning, and she says, Ralph, I was wondering if you could suggest good companies that would be worth working for. I love working, would like to give my time to the companies that are worthy of my time. Well, Karen, that's a question easily answered. I would, for example, recommend Patagonia near Santa Barbara that has great worker relations, great environmental record. They put out outdoor clothing and equipment, some of the best in the world. And the head of it, Yvonne Chouinard, has written a book called The Responsible Company, which really is authentic, not just a bunch of cliches. Then there's the Interface Corporation in Atlanta, which was turned around by the late Ray Anderson, great CEO. They are moving toward 100% recycling of their tile carpet business, a very environmentally oriented and proselytize other corporations around the country. And for a bigger list, go to the website for Social Venture Network. Those are all the companies, mid-sized, some of them still run by their founders. You know, they were Ben and Jerry's, Esprit, companies like that. Ben and Jerry's were by Unilever, but you can go to that website and see when their annual convention is, get their materials. There are probably well over 100 companies on that list. 
Well, very good. Thank you for that question, Sharon. This next question comes from a listener, Karen MacArthur, and it's pretty germane to what we were just talking about earlier and the upcoming midterms. Karen says, I'm concerned that people displaced after a natural disaster are unable to vote in elections. Well, this may seem like a low priority following what happened to the Florida panhandle. It is an important issue and the implications can be felt outside the state. What can be done at a national level to ensure people are able to vote if their precincts have been destroyed or if they've temporarily displaced to another location on November 6th? These natural disasters will keep coming and we should be prepared. Karen MacArthur, talk about a question I didn't even occur to me, Steve. Yeah. Wow, this is important. Contact the Federal Elections Commission in Washington. They're supposed to be relevant on this. Ask them what's being done about it. Are they expanding absentee voting through the mail? Are they bringing portable precincts to replace the ones that were destroyed? This could turn that election for the U.S. Senate in Florida, which could have consequences for who controls the Senate. Also, contact uh, Senator Ben Nelson's campaign office and ask them what they're doing about it, because they've got to be aware of it. People up north who haven't had these hurricanes recently be so destructive are not aware of that. And this is going to happen again and again, and especially coming out of the Gulf and the Atlantic in the southern section of the U.S., Thank you for that question, Karen. You actually thought of something Ralph has not thought of before. That is very rare. Very good question, Karen. Thank you for your questions. And I also want to thank our guest today, Michael Lighty, who's on sabbatical from National Nurses United. And he's campaigning around the country for Medicare for All. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap Up. A transcript of this show will appear on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website. For Ralph's weekly column, it's free. Go to nader.org. For more from Russell Mokhyber, go to corporatecrimereporter.com. And laugh yourself serious with Ralph's new book, How the Rats Reformed the Congress. Check out the episode we did on it three weeks ago and how we need to organize in every congressional district. To acquire a copy, go to ratsreformcongress.org. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour are Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew Marin. Our executive producer is Alan Minsky. Our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, was written and performed by Kemp Harris. Our proofreader is Elizabeth Solomon. Join us next week for another provocative show on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Talk to you then, Ralph. Thank you very much, Steve. Readers think, thinkers read, and are more likely to act. Spread the word with your friends and neighbors. Hi, this is Jimmy Lee Wirt, producer of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Welcome to the wrap-up. First, Steve asked Michael Lighty another question about the fight for Medicare for All. Before I let you go, I'd like to ask a question. Sure. Five years ago, which is almost the life of this program as we're heading toward our fifth year, this whole thing, Medicare for All, was a taboo subject. You never heard it mentioned in national media. Now I'm not only hearing it mentioned, but the president seems to have to put out an op-ed in USA Today, the paper that has the largest circulation in America, against it. So my question is, you're campaigning around the country. How is this Medicare for All issue resonating with people? And what is the toughest or most common question you confront among people about it? It's resonating hugely, Steve. And it's, it's no question because literally we've tried everything else when it comes to health care except what's popular and works, which is you know, expanding and improving Medicare. So people ask, how do we pay for it? That's often what you get. And the simple truth is, is that we will publicly finance this through taxes and we will eliminate all copays, deductibles, and premiums. You'll never have to deal with a private health insurance company again to get the care you need. And that change is a mind twist for some. We've been told government's the problem or even government's the enemy. And now we have to understand that rising prices are driving health care costs. And the only way to control those prices is to have us collectively in one program. And that is utilizing the power of government to control those prices, control costs, and guarantee health care. And that does take a switch for some people. But what we know is, as Ralph said, it's a publicly financed system now. We're not getting our money's worth. And so what we have to do is take that on directly and say, how else are we going to control this monstrosity of the health insurance industry? People say, well, we don't want government-run health care. Well, 
Frankly, the alternative is industry-run healthcare, is health insurance-run healthcare, and that is killing us. And the truth is, Medicare works. And so I think it's very p- profound when we talk about these issues. When I respond, as I say, do doctors like Medicare? Mostly they do. Do they like private insurance? No, they don't. Do patients and seniors get the care they need? We actually believe in healthcare as a human right once you turn 65. We now just need to make that universal. So if I'm a, just a person on the street and I'm doing the math and you're telling me, well, you won't have to do co-pays and your taxes will be lower, has there ever been a study or is there any figures you could tell like somebody like me, okay, you pay this much in taxes, but you pay this much in co-pays, look at the difference. Yes, we did it. We did a financing study on the state single payer bill. Now that the session's over, that SB 562 campaign is over too. But during it, we did a study, and we were able to demonstrate that even with an increase in payroll tax, for example, an average middle-class family making, I think, around $65,000 a year in California would get a 9% raise, that essentially the savings that they would achieve are equal to 9% of their income. And that is typical. Even low-income individuals who, in some cases, because they have these Medicaid and other programs, don't pay a lot in health care, their costs would go down as well. The only folks whose costs would go up are the wealthy. They're currently paying about 0.4% on average of their income for health care, while the rest of us are paying 10 15%. We're able to ratchet that down dramatically and actually give working families in this country, uh, on average, a 9% raise. Well, that seems like a very positive message or a framing, which is get health care and give yourself a raise. (laughs) That's right. And it's also, you know, you think about this, how it ripples out in the economy. Who would be the biggest beneficiary if state governments were not paying hundreds of billions of dollars or school districts were not paying hundreds of millions of dollars for health care? Well, it would be the education system because it's so funded by, of course, through state budgets. Any health care savings generate directly and translate directly into improved education budgets smaller class sizes. And so when you see this mass action of teachers in West Virginia, Oklahoma, and Arizona, it starts with healthcare for a good reason, because they know that's what's killing these districts. And that's what's hurting them as teachers and their kids. You hit the point, that's the main roadblock that the anti-single payer crowd tries to put, which is, how are you going to pay for it? It's too expensive, right? right? Well, here's one of my answers. How come the Head of General Motors, Jack Smith, who was head of General Motors Canada, then became head of General Motors Worldwide, favored single payer, because he he wouldn't have to pay the insurance premiums for the auto workers, which totaled more than the cost of steel that GM had to buy. And he saw it as a competitive leveling of the playing field with companies in other countries where they have single payer and the companies don't have to pay these soaring health insurance premiums for their workers. So someone like Jack Smith, and he's not the only one in the world of CEOs of big companies who know the single payer overall is much more efficient and produces much more competitive corporate behavior with their competitors overseas. But that seems like such a powerful lobby. And I know we've talked to a gentleman, I'm forgetting his name right now, who did the documentary Fix It, who's a businessman who's making the case that business should be all over this. How come they're not still? Yeah, that's Richard Masters. Uh, I mean, I I think it's ideological. I think they sit on the boards of these companies. And and honestly, the business case for single payer is unassailable. There is no question that the bottom line of every business in this country would be served. Workers would end job lock. There would be new resources for innovation. And just as you say, Ralph, they would never have to deal with these insurance companies again. And I talked to small business folks and they want this. But you've got this whole construct that says, well, God, if we expand government and health care, what are they going to do next? It comes down to Congress, comes down to a couple hundred more members of Congress being turned around to get a sizable majority and join the 120 members of the House that are already on board on H. R-676. Remember that bill number, listeners, and get on the backs of your senators and representatives right when they're most sensitive before the November elections next month. Well, thank you, Michael. We appreciate that. Oh, thank you both. Now, Ralph answers one last listener question. This next question comes from listener Tara 
Carrion. She says, Dearest Ralph, I want to start a national woman's party, and I want you to advise me every step of the way. I watched what you went through when you ran for office the two times and the surreal vicious attacks by the Democrats on your vote-taking activity and would like to benefit from your experience. I've started a Twitter account, USA Women's Party, to begin the process. I know nothing about the party-making process, but my husband is a lawyer and can help do the legal work. Would you consent to be the main creator of a far overdue USA Women's Party? Please let me know. Well, Tara, you know I propose all the time that there be a lot of choices for the voters. And so I like the idea of people starting independent parties, third parties. It invigorates the stagnant political process dominated by the two-party duopoly of the Republicans and Democrats who seem to be getting more and more alike and dialing for the same commercial dollars, although Trump has widened the gap obviously between the Republicans and Democrats recently. But on military and foreign affairs, corporate welfare, Wall Street, they're too much alike for my taste, and I hope for a lot of other Americans' taste. So good luck on that. Now, I'm not in a position to help anyone start a political party. I think the Green Party has about the best platform. Still, they need to get a lot more energy to grassroots and a lot more decentralized fundraising so they can have more staff. But if you go to the search engines, you'll find a lot of information and books on third parties. If your husband gets involved with your quest, all the technical details can be taken care of. But the historical surges in third parties, you need to read some books on third parties, starting with the Liberty Party in 1840, opposed to slavery, the People's Party, the Women's Suffrage Party, all the way to the populist, progressive, socialist, Green Party tradition. There's plenty of material on that. Well, thank you for that question, Tara. And that's a wrap. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour when we talk ballot access with Richard Winger, editor of Ballot Access News. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting ready.